Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. And we're live. This is April the 5th, 2013. And I hope I can stay awake. Last night, I did the Coast to Coast show with George Nury. And you know, those of you that listen to that, it's at night and it goes on very late. Uh, I didn't get to bed till 4.30 this morning. <laughs> But, you know, he goes all over the world. They kept advertising on the show. This is the show that never sees the light of day (laughs) because they're on at night. (laughs) So that was a long night, and I didn't get a lot of sleep, so I've been trying to stay awake. So I'm not going to fall asleep during this program anyway. But George is a wonderful interviewer, and it was really, really good. We covered a great deal of subjects. Okay, so we've been getting a lot of calls today, so <laughs> it always happens after we do that show. Right. And people saying they liked it. He said on the air that he had an email from someone who said they didn't believe in life after death. Mm. That when they died they died and that was it. Okay. And he he asked me what I thought about it and of course I know better. But I said, "Well, where did he think he came from?" Where is he going to he just going to stop existing or what? George said that's what he asked him. Do you just did you just appear here or what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh anyway, it was a lot of we had a lot of callers and it was really interesting uh in the questions were all over the place. Well, maybe we'll do the same tonight. Uh anybody who wants to call in is perfectly welcome to do so. We had a lot of callers last week and that was really good. Because I'm just going to go over some email questions tonight and answer those. So if anyone else wants to call in and ask questions, uh, just go ahead and do it. Let me go ahead and give you, give out the toll-free number if you want to call in. one 627 6008 888-627-6008. And Julia's here, and we're going to answer questions. Now, we're live tonight, but we're going to be, uh, what do you want to call it? On. on. <laughs> It'll be on uh, recording, I mm-hmm. guess, out of the archives for about the next three, four weeks into into May, because we've really got a lot of things coming up. It's getting to where staying home is a luxury, because we're on the road so much. <laughs> But next Friday, we have our UFO conference in Eureka Springs. That's the one that I inherited. And it, boy, is really going strong. Right. Uh, We have just about sold out. There are still some seats if somebody wants to come. Right. (laughs) It's selling very quickly. And this will be the biggest one I think they've ever had there. Yeah, it very well could be. We'll see how many walk-ins we have. If that's the case, you know, that may push it over. Yeah, mm-hmm. because we're trying to find extra room somewhere in that auditorium. But anyway, uh, you know, this is the longest-running UFO conference in, in America. It's 26 years now. The longest continually running conference, UFO, UFO conference. Mm-hmm. The one that Bob Brown had in Laughlin, and he sold to... John Roa, who had it this last time in, uh, had it for the last two years in Scottsdale, Arizona, is the biggest, they say. But we're the oldest. But now I wonder, we may be competition. <laughs> At least give them a run for the money. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's going to look like anyway. Mm-hmm. And we have many wonderful speakers, if anybody wants to come up, and they better register quick. Right, yeah, we... <laughs> Uh, uh, we, we've only got about um, 40 seats now for the main auditorium, and then if we have to, we'll, we have an overflow room that will hold 60 people. So that's how close we are to being completely full. And the overflow room, we'll have to watch it on a screen. Yes. Yeah. It's another part of the building. But, uh, yeah, we are just about at the limit of mm-hmm. it. We have wonderful speakers. We've got uh, Jaime Marsad is coming from Mexico. And he's the one that has uh, the, like the 60 Minutes in Mexico. And he's a very highly respected UFO investigator down there. Mexico is a hot spot. 
and he's bringing wonderful uh, videos of UFO coverage. It's going to be really exciting. And then we've got uh, Nigel Grace coming from uh, London, who's going to be talking about the Bosnian pyramids and the tunnels underneath them. And I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. Right. And uh, Jeff Wilson Mm -hmm. is going to be talking about the crop circles in America and showing pictures of those. We've been so used to all the history of the UFO conference. It's always been crop circles in England. And I really didn't realize there were so many right here in the United States. So he's going to be covering that and showing pictures of that. Mm -hmm. And then we have Ted Phillips is going to talk about this thing that he discovered, and he's been investigating it for many years. He found it in a Slovenia, inside a mountain. It's like it's a craft. And the mountain has grown around it, so you can get an idea how long that ship would have been there. And I think they said they found a way into the ship. But he's going to be talking about the research he's been doing for a long time on that. Because you can't just walk in there. It's very dangerous territory where this is located. And so he had to, always had to go by himself, afraid somebody would follow him to find this. But it's uh, way out in the middle of nowhere. So he's going to be talking about that. Mm-hmm. Then we have Larry Sikander. I can never remember how to pronounce his uh, name. He's the one that has the Bob White object that fell off of a UFO. And it's been analyzed as being extraterrestrial. He's got to have that there, and he's going to show that. I think when they say, well, they probably said it's been analyzed as not earthly. So does that mean, I mean, how do they know? I mean, They just said it didn't come from Earth. Exactly. It's not earthly. It's rather than, they didn't say definitely it was extraterrestrial, did they? They just said it was not, not of Earth. <laughs> well, extraterrestrial means off Earth, I guess, that name, doesn't it? <laughs> Hmm. And um, then Linda Howe, Linda Booten Howe will be there. She's been there almost as long as I have. <laughs> and she's going to give her latest research that she's come up with. She's an investigative reporter, and she's always finding new things. I think she's going to be showing pictures of the different types of uh, ET right. and comparing those. And then Dr. J.J. Hurtek is going to be there, and he's well known for his books, The Keys of Enoch. He's got several books out, and uh, he's going to be talking about the origin of life on Earth. <laughs> Who else do we got now? Um, Larry Flaxman, we just said of him. And he's going to be talking about the propulsion right. of the craft the way he's investigated things like that. And oh, there's some more because we have nine people. Nine speakers. Well, you. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> but uh, I'll be there, but I'm always there anyway. Yeah, but this time you'll be speaking. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, I mean, I spoke last year, too. For the I first was... time. For the first time. There. Last year, so I said, for the first time. First time at that one, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to have a really good lineup. Mm -hmm. We've already got three speakers for next year. Everybody's wanting to come into this. So anyway, I guess it's something that will be ongoing and continuing. We'll have two conferences every year. This one and our one in July, the Transformation Conference. But this is this Friday, so we'll be going over there in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, the middle of the beautiful Ozarks here. So if anybody wants to come, it's it's going to be a really good sh- uh, show. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Well, and we do have the UFO contest still going on. Mm-hmm. That, the photo contest. Yeah, it's the photo contest. If anybody out there has ever taken a picture of a UFO, or a video of one, and you don't know what to do with it, we are having this contest. And we're just charging $5 to enter the picture, and you can win a $100 prize. And, of course, the money that's paid in goes into Lou Farish's trust fund. Right. 
where we are sponsoring uh, investigators who need money for their investigations if they need equipment and things like that, which that is also a very valuable program. That's a grant program. If anyone needs money for their investigations, they should contact us also. This is all part of Lou Farish's trust fund to carry on research. Right. We have a link on the UFO page for that, so if they want to just they can go over and that will take them to the page. It has all the information on that. Mm -hmm. But we're already getting entries into the UFO contest, and we're going to let the audience vote on them. Mm -hmm. right. But if you enter it, don't send your only copy. You know, don't send the original, because we can't guarantee that something won't happen to it. Send us a copy, and we'll try to make sure it gets back to you, but we don't want to be responsible for the one and only one. And if you enter it, send it in, and give us about one page description of how it occurred, how you came to take the picture. And no computer generated. Right. Oh, just regular photographs, and once we're getting are really good. Right. Yeah. So it's going be interesting. Some of them, they didn't even know what they had until they, the film came out. Exactly. But. I want to say develop the film, but you don't develop it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but they just took pictures and didn't realize what they had on it until it came out. Mm -hmm. So that's another interesting sideline. So if you have any pictures, even if you can't come... Send them to us and enter them into the contest. And that'll be the last day on Sunday we'll be judging those. Right. So it's going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And there's a whole lot going on. I, it's more than I can even remember here. It's going to go fast. That building is going to be packed. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so that's next Friday, so we can't do our show on that night. And the week after that, I'm going to be in Tennessee. Uh, what is that called? It's the, the Four Coptic, Corners. The Coptic Conference. The Coptic Conference, but it's a Johnson, Johnson, Johnson City. Mm -hmm. Right there where it's a, it, they all come together in that corner. Right. The Coptic Conference, and I'll be doing a lecture there. That's the week after. Then the week after that, going toward the end of April, we've got my class, and that's going to be here in... Um, Arkansas, and it's the level one and level two classes of my right. method, my hypnosis method. But level one is completely oh, it's full. Out. It's full, yeah. We oh. can't get any more in that. No. <laughs> it's as full as it can be, and level two even, I think we can't get any more in no, that. No, I, I think there's still some room, but not much. Not much, because we don't want that one to be as big, right. because level two is individual attention. Right. And from our online classes now, we're getting some that are wanting to come over into the level two. Mm -hmm. To We have uh, honing of the skills in that and individual attention right. to the practitioners. But that's going to be going on for the next two weeks after that. So that's going to take us into May. So it's going to, to be a little while before we get back live. Uh, when is the next conference live one here, the, the class, the conference, the class, the level one class, isn't it? The next class in, the, in America that's anywhere close to America? We're not we're only having one level two. Well, we're having we? one in Canada the uh, in June, probably the end of June. And after that, we're having the the next one is on the on a Panama Canal cruise. So that's mm -hmm. the, because it leaves from America and ends in America. <laughs> yeah, but we're having a level two, I think, in June or July. Yeah, we're having that quarterly to to help out the ones that are all coming out of the online class. But um, it's really interesting. It's in September, isn't it? October. October is when we're having the Panama Canal. And we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to combine a class with a vacation? Right. So anybody out there who's looking to take the Level 1 class, this would be an excellent opportunity to also have a vacation. Yeah, it works out. Now, it is longer, so it, it, overall it's probably more than you would spend to to come to a class. But for a vacation uh, and a and a class and everything, when you factor it up, it's, it's less expensive than it would be to get a hotel, you know, for that period of time and food and everything. It's, and then you get to see all these other countries as well. 
because you know when you're on a cruise, uh, everything else is taken care of. Right. The food and everything is just one big vacation. Food 24 odd hours a day. <laughs> but I think it begins in San Diego. Yeah. And then we go through the down through the Panama Canal. We're stopping in South America and uh, Mexico, and it'll end up in. My, I think it's Miami or Fort Lauderdale. I think it's Fort Lauderdale. And that's on the end. But it's uh, almost, what is it, 10 days? Or 14 days. Two weeks. Uh-huh. And if you factor it in, it's a very reasonable price for just the cruise alone. Uh-huh. And then you add the class in, it's it's really very economical. To have, and you have both, the vacation and the class at the same time. Right. So We had to get a... A uh, two-week cruise, so we could get enough days at sea to have the class. Right. Because we could only do that when the ship is sailing. Everybody wants to get off and see the countries on those days we're in port. So if you're interested in that, well, that is in October, and the all the information is on our website. Yeah, DoloresCannon.com. As a matter of fact, when you first pull up the site, that comes up as a pop-up, just so it's easy to find. Mm-hmm. So we're already getting people signing up for that. Yeah. But then we're also going out of the country again, but those are the only things available in this country right now. Yeah. We'll be traveling, like you said, to Canada. Uh, where is that? It's up around Vancouver? Uh, it's Alberta? Uh, Alberta. Alberta. Right. People, Cal- Calgary. We're actually Calgary in Alberta. Because people kept wanting us to come to Canada. And I've been to Montreal several times, but they said, well, we'll do one in Canada. If we are trying to cut back. Right. I mean, only one person. <laughs> Pretty hard to keep up with all this. And that's why the online is, is the taking off. Yes, and it, and it is taking off. I think we've now had um, 100 people go through there. So. It's only been a few weeks. Right. So then we'll be in uh, England in May doing our classes over there. Right. That's the only one in Europe, I think. Yeah. So they're going to have to get to these, or we're not going to come back again in the the, the year like we did last year. We, we won't be back return. to Europe until the spring of 2014. Because that's what we're trying to do, to keep from going back to the same places again and again. Well, it's just you, there's so much demand, and we're trying to get to the places. <laughs> so... But that'll be England. Anybody in Europe, right. uh, the continent, usually okay. come over to that one because that's closer. But then after the Panama Canal cruise, uh, we start off October, or November. Right. That yeah. After the, the cruise, cruise goes into the beginning of November, and then the following week you'll be doing the UFO conference in Tur- in Istanbul. Istanbul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Hakton wanted me to come back for that when I did the two-day seminar over there last month. He's having a huge UFO conference in Istanbul, and it's about the biggest one in Europe because he is the only UFO museum in Europe. So I told him I'd come back for that. Then we will leave from Istanbul and go to Beijing, Beijing. having some more classes there, and then to Taiwan to have classes. Right. Japan, Japan, and then down into Australia. Yeah, Sydney. We're just going to do one city in Australia this okay. time. Mm-hmm. And then after that's over, it'll be December. Right, and actually you'll be here for Christmas. But you also, you missed, you left um, a part out. Oh, uh, South that, America? Yeah, September we're going to do Mexico and maybe two countries and two cities in South America. Yeah, that's right. I knew I was leaving mm-hmm. something out. Right. So every month from here on, we're going to be doing something. Pretty much, yeah. But they want us to come to South America, and Argentina is definitely in. And we're we, looking at Brazil. Brazil. And Mexico is right. definitely in. So yeah. we'll be going down there and giving those classes in September. And, of course, we have our uh, transformation conferences in July. July 19th to the 21st. And then we have workshops happening on the 18th as well as the 22nd and 23rd. So a lot of workshops going on around it. Because this is the one, it's our eighth year now. Yeah. And this is the one where we feature 
our authors, the new authors that are coming up with our company. And we try to give them a showcase so they can get out there and uh, get learn to talk, learn to speak before people. So it's very good for them. So that's going to be in July. And our keynote right now is William Henry. Yes. And we have some other names that are possible we may bring in besides the authors. Right. So it, <laughs> that's interesting. We're going to have two conferences this year. And be that way from now on, I guess. Right. Let's not have any more. <laughs> the two is enough. Because <laughs> these are getting big. Yes, they are. And they're, they're a lot of fun. <laughs> they are. A lot of work to put them on, yes, but they are fun when they happen. So if anybody's interested in any of these things, contact our office. And we have the schedule on the uh, in the pages, too, so you'll know exactly the dates of these things. And you contact our website, which is with Ozark Mountain Publishing. So it's O Z A R K M T dot com. Or if you're overseas, it's O Z A R K M T dot com. Or you said they can just type in Dolores Cannon. Yes. And that will mm-hmm. bring it up also. Right. And you'll have the where you're appearing all listed. Um, and one of the things that's happening this weekend, fingers crossed will be the unveiling of the new Ozark Mountain uh, website. Oh. So, And then we will actually have uh, information about the conference. Right now, it's, there's no information out there. And it's because we're waiting to get this site unveiled, and then it'll have it with it. So Everything. It's all so it's, there we're, together. We're going so modern. Mm-hmm. Every, it seems like every, every time you turn around, all the electronics is changing and advancing. Mm-hmm. It's hard to keep up with all of this. Right. The only way is to have a webmaster who does all of this for us. Right. So, so they've been working hard, and um, it's just a matter of me. You know, they're, they're working on it now, and I hope they, they said the plan was to get it to go live this weekend. So sometime this weekend. Okay. So if you go on there, you'll find the list of all the things we're going to be involved with. Uh, so I think they'll have all their questions answered, and then people are always calling the office. Right. Our 800 number is 1-800-935-0045 if you want any information about anything we're going to be doing. But um, we have a lot of people working for us, and they've all got jobs in this trying to take care of everything. Right. So right now it's a UFO conference is the next thing. Okay. So, right now, I guess we've got some email questions we were going to go through. All right. Let's see what you've got. Well, people are always emailing me. Oh, we get tons of emails. And it's very difficult for me to answer. We get so many. And I told them last night on the Coast to Coast, I do read the emails, even when we get thousands coming in. I do read them. I just don't have time to personally answer them all. So sometimes once in a while I'll pull some out and think we can use them uh, on the show. Right, because they're good. I mean, sometimes they've been asked by several people, and so that means, okay, this is a good topic that people want to know about. Yeah, and some of them I think I've answered, but I guess I haven't if they keep bringing the question up again. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they'll say in the email, can you answer on the air if you can't answer by mail. Okay. Um, This is an interesting one. Whenever I've seen footage of an an abductee, it's always a white person. I'm a Hindu with origins in India. Have you had abduction reports of people from other cultures? Do Indians, Chinese, or black people claim to have abductions too? If so, are their experiences different in any way? Betty and Barney Hill were black, weren't they? He was black. Oh, okay. Uh Uh-huh. That was the very first case that ever was reported, and it got the whole thing started Mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, he was black. And I can't remember because I have people of every race imaginable coming to my office. And it doesn't seem to make any difference. They all have the same experiences, the same reports. You've had them where they've had the, the 
abduction or you know, the visitation experiences. Yeah, because they don't like the word abduction. Right. I don't remember Hindus. I have people coming to my office that are Hindus, but I don't remember UFO cases with them. Right. But I can't see why it would be any different. No, it shouldn't be. No, I imagine it's, you know, because they're, they're, one, they're checking in on their own, and then, two, they want their own. This is to raise the energy and the vibrations unilaterally around the world. So it's not, you know, you don't, it's probably proportionate to... Uh, the what's coming in? Okay, I was wanting to say to the population, so you'd have more like ratio to the population, but they're actually it has something to do with the land mass. That's interesting. Land mass. Well, it would make sense. India is a huge country. You just can't leave them out altogether. They would have oh. to have the same monitoring going on and visitation mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. check on the people. It's like they have to check all the different areas to see what effects everything is having, you know, in the different areas. So. Yeah. So I don't see any discrimination. Maybe on the movies and the TV it always shows white people, but I don't think there is any difference. Probably not. I'm, yeah. Okay. We don't know that to be certain, but probably I don't see why it would be. You know, it would so. make sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. We've got several here about ETs. That's why I thought we would answer those first. This one has a little strange... I don't know where they ever got this idea. (laughs) They said... uh, This woman thinks it's horrible to imagine being monitored by beings unable to grasp the concept of love, happiness, joy, compassion, etc., etc., who regard regard emotion as something detrimental to human development. Isn't this that is the whole uh, reason for living? I can't accept that interpretation. Sorry. Well, I never said that. That they didn't have the concept of love and happiness and joy. No, you did say that jealousy on some planets was considered a disease. It's like some of these extreme emotions. They do not have those. And they don't have the wide range of emotion. But yeah, because I've never said they didn't have any mm-hmm. concept of emotion at all. Right. No, but they are love. I mean, when oh, if you can tap into them, oh, that's what you feel is this love. And they have such love for the human race. Mm-hmm. That's why I've never had any negative experiences. But they've told me they feel emotion, but it's just not to the wide range that we do. Because with humans... We shift emotions constantly, and that's what's confusing to them. That we can go from uh, love, hate, sadness, uh, jealousy, rage, we can do all of that just shifting one after the other very quickly. And that's it's amazing to them how we can change emotions so fast that they have a hard time keeping up with it. That's what's confusing. But to them, they do experience emotion, but only one at a time. And it's probably, you're right, the extreme emotions uh, are frightening to them because they don't understand it. But they don't jump all over the place like we do. If you think about it, like, and it's what we're going to, um, when you're in the middle of a situation and you're reacting to everything, you have all these emotions. But when you're able to pull back and look at the bigger picture of it, you remove yourself to some degree from the emotions. You still have some, but you don't have all that extreme stuff going on, that you know, gut-wrenching stuff. That's kind of how it is. They are just pulled back to a degree where they can have a different aspect of the emotion. It's, you know, it's, just, it's just lesser. It's, I mean, it's still love, but it's not the... Oh, dying passion, all that stuff, you know. (laughs) But they do have it. And also, uh, they don't experience fear like we do. That's what they said. Fear is strictly a human emotion, and it it really confuses them. They said fear is an illusion. And that's what really they don't understand when we are afraid of them. So that's why they have to, when they're having the abductions, to do it in a way that the person will not remember because they don't want to upset their lives. 
when you think about it, when you have the big picture again, you see the, the grand scheme of things. So you know what the whole thing is. You don't. You aren't afraid of something because you know the big, you know everything going on. Why it's happening. Right, but when you're in, the, in it, if you're down on the trenches, in the trenches, and you could just see one step ahead of you, you can't see all of that. We, we tend to be afraid of what we don't know and what we can't see. Yeah, so that's the big, difference there again. They, they can see things. So We're always afraid of what we don't understand. But I don't know where this person got the idea of this. It's horrifying to imagine being being monitored by beings unable to grasp the concept of love and happiness. Now, the only thing is like the little grays, because they're that robotic, you know, biologic. They don't necessarily, they're just they're just workers, so they may not necessarily have. The they're emotions. not programmed by, by right. uh, to experience that. But anyway, I didn't say that, so I don't know where they got that, but they may have got it somewhere else anyway. I just heard whenever you were saying not programmed, and they, they just said, we are programmed to help. Okay, that's the little guys, the mm-hmm. little guys, and they're programmed by the big grays on the ship. Okay. Uh, this is sent by somebody in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. They, Rio de Janeiro. De Janeiro. <laughs> yeah, I can't talk right now. I still have hangover from last night. Okay. Anyway, she said, I'm from Brazil. And she did see say here, um, don't ever think you talk to the walls. Because I did make that remark a lot at the beginning. Yeah, now you talk to me. They don't talk that's to why me. I brought her in, so I have somebody to talk to. Otherwise, I'm just talking to the walls. And unless we got callers, I don't know if anybody's even listening. So I said, maybe I'm just talking to the walls. But she said here, uh, don't ever think you talk to the walls. You see, I'm in Brazil, South America. <laughs> okay, but this is what she said. Uh, I had a very strange experience. I woke up about 5.30 a.m. feeling a presence in my room, and with my eyes closed, I saw an alien near my bed who said telepathically, don't worry, what I'm going to do is for the growth of your understanding. And he pointed at me a kind of metal pen, and from it came a white ray that caused me from the head to my feet, that caught me, caught me from the head to the feet, and after that my whole body pulsated. Then I went to sleep and woke up at 8 o'clock. So she wanted to know, can I tell her what could have happened? I'm 60 years old, but I have a job, work six hours a day, don't have much time for reading. So it's like, she wondered what's going on there. I didn't feel fear, but I prayed to St. Michael just in case. (laughs) (laughs) The being told her, don't worry, what I'm going to do is for the growth of your understanding. So it wasn't anything physical then that she needed done, apparently. Yeah, maybe a download. Yeah. Yeah, definitely energy. If she pointed this metal pin at her and the white ray came out, causing her whole body to pulsate. That's rather the way in the healing, when I have the healing sessions with the people, they're always told it's a white light and energy comes out and comes down through them. Right. It's about the same thing. It's all energy. Right. And then when they're downloaded also, it's a, it's a beam of light that comes in. So. Mm-hmm. So there was nothing negative about that. They're just, they've been taking care of it. Even though she's 60, she's probably first wave. Um, I I would say she can probably just ask questions, even though um, she thinks they're not there anymore. Um, she remembers what that being felt like. So she could actually, and anybody can do this. You can tap into them and just ask, you know, what was that about? What were you doing? What was it for? You already said this. Can you give me some more information? Just like you ask whenever you get in contact. We ask a lot of questions. Right. Just ask questions. And they're happy to answer. Yeah. But I don't see anything negative about it. She said I didn't feel fear. But uh, then she just went to sleep and woke up. That's normal. (laughs) Anyway, yeah, we've had a lot of cases of these where there's nothing lasting that happens anyway. 
Let's see, this one here I've answered before. But, okay, I'll put it down here. Huh. This one here gave a whole page of ten different questions. And some of them I think I've answered before. Okay, let me see here. She said, I love your work, et cetera, et cetera. I've been doing my own research for a number of years and find that it's outstanding the info I've come to learn or relearn. <laughs> However, there's a, a few questions I would like you to clear up in my own mind, if that's okay. Do ETs go to the same place when they choose not to live anymore? And I think I know the answer, but let's hear it from you. Meaning spirit. spirit yeah, world. when they die. Mm -hmm. I think I had a client that asked me the same thing. What happens when the ETs die? Where mm -hmm. do they go? Yeah. They go to the same place we go. They're beings just like us. <laughs> we all go to the spirit side. Right. And where we have the um, life review and the, and the download. And then we go before the council or the board. Decide what we're going to do the next time. Right. And when I'm here, because they, they may, because they're on a different frequency level, it's possible that they, I'm probable that they will go to a different frequency. Like what you said, you go, when you cross over, you go to different frequencies based on your growth and your development at that time. And you can't go any higher than mm -hmm. you're vibrating at. I wouldn't be surprised if they had a different part of the spirit realm. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. That just mm -hmm. dealt with those type of beings. Well, they're, they're vibra already vibrating at a higher frequency, so it could very well be that they're in a different, in a, in a just different location, but different level. maybe not, you know. <laughs> you know, we're always choosing roles, too, so, mm -hmm. and we're all always flipping around to different planets and different places, so... Yeah, one of my last clients I just did a few days ago went to a life where he was an ET on a very strange-looking planet. It was almost ethereal-type planet, and he was a being. And their job, they had machines. He called it machines for want of anything else because they weren't as physical as we think. And their job was to shoot or send loving energy to different planets, the kind of energy that they need to develop and to grow. And he was especially sending it toward Earth. And I've had others tell me the same thing. That's their job on these planets is to direct the energy to certain planets that need that if they need help. And uh, so they have different jobs like that. They're very loving. And he was doing that. Then he decided, I wonder what it would be like to go there and be on the receiving end of the energy. And so he asked permission, and they let him go. Well, that was nice. And then he went into this body lying on the bed. He's that being now, that uh, personality. Right. Right. So this would be definitely a volunteer because it's his first life in a human body. But I've had some other ones talk about that planet. There may be other planets, too, where their job is to send a special type of loving energy. And I asked them, wasn't that um, interference? And they said, no, we send it out, then it's up to the beings whether they accept it. And that's how you do it when you do energy work. You, send, you can send love. It's the same thing. That was one of the first things I was taught or something. I don't know if I was taught or I learned it later. But you send energy out to people, and it's up to them to receive it or not. They don't have to. It can just go on by. Mm -hmm. But it's whoever wants to receive it will. Well, that's what they said. It's going to, for instance, the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Not everyone would be affected and changed because some of them don't want to receive it. Right. They aren't open to it. So it would only go to those, those who were open to receiving, and then their life could be opened up and changed. So that way it's not interference. Right. And something that's coming, and it was interesting, was um, it's something you, you say in your lectures. And when you say it, they've, they've done this little, it's like 
sometimes I'll get a, a message. It'd be like, well, it's, it's more like this, <laughs> something. And so, and this is along the same line. Um, when you you said, you know, the the call went out for the volunteers, they said Earth is in trouble. Well, what they've said is it wasn't Earth that was in trouble. It's the people on Earth that was in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Not Earth itself. She's doing her job just fine. She's moving along. You know, she may be limping because of all the stuff everybody's all doing. All the junk. But she's not, she's not in trouble because um, she can easily, you know, uh, reverse what's going on and everything. Uh, and she's shifting. She's going to do it. It's she's, the people that needed the help. She's going into another incarnation. Yes. Yes. And if people want to go with her, they have right. to change right. Change their vibrations. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, it was the people that were, you know, not realizing. Um, I mean, they, they have to shift. You have to shift your vibrations if you're going with her. And so, and it was there, they were stuck. So that's where the new vibrations had to come in just to help them understand that new vibration. Because mm-hmm. they had no examples. Mm-hmm. It's like we do better when we have examples before us. And then, okay, then we, we raise our vibrations. Mm-hmm. So that was interesting now that this is going to be in some future books about these planets where they are sending the love energy out. Well, but that's it's great. It's going to other planets too, but Earth especially needed it. So he decided, let's go and see what it feels like. And he said when he was leaving, the one he asked on that planet, they said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what you're going into. Why do you think we're sending love there? <laughs> <laughs> you, you sure you really want to go? Right. right. Thank you. Oh, Was there a caller? Yes. Oh, okay. I, but I didn't hear it. She heard it. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Yeah? My name is Amy. My name is hi, Amy. Amy. I have a question. Hi. Go ahead. Okay, I have a question. I have heard you um, on a, a radio program, and you had mentioned, um, I, I think it had to do with the fact that people would ask questions, wondering what their purpose is on Earth or something like that. And and I don't know if you you said specifically indigos, but you had mentioned that um, that they're they're kind of act similar to like an antenna. So wherever they go, that energy is connected to that area. I don't know if that's, that makes sense, but that's kind of the yeah, way I understood what you said. Second wave, the second wave, which are like antennas. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't get that word she said. Okay, so what yeah. was the question about that? So the question is, I've, um, I, well, now, granted, I don't have a, I haven't had a car for several months, but I've just had the urge to walk around a lot, and I'm really enjoying enjoying that, and I'm wondering if, that's partly due to the fact that maybe my energy is needed in different areas. <laughs> yeah, because that's what we say. The second wave are like antennas, uh, generators, mm-hmm. channels, of energy. channels of energy. They are being sent this loving energy, and they're supposed to be spreading it. Now, they don't know they're doing it, mm-hmm. but you could even walk into a crowd of people, like in the mall or, or stores, and everybody that you come in contact with is affected by that. So I imagine if you're just walking around, the energy is affecting everyone. Right. It may very well be because when you're walking out like that, you don't, you know, when you're in a car, you have a barrier around you. Yeah. Where when you're walking, it may very well be while you're in that position just to, to spread it around. Do you smile at people a lot? And, you're in, and when you're walking, you interact with People. Right, that's what I just got. I see you smiling at people a lot. <laughs> do you? But now, and what is? Do I? I mean, I'm kind of quiet, but I have been. I do a little both. Like I do, I I enjoy people watching, but I have been interacting with with people a lot. Like I'll, I'll com- like if somebody I'll compliment their clothes, or if I see something, I might you know ask a question, or if I see something that they have that reminds me of something, I'll I'll bring it up. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's important. That's really important. Well, they've said uh, that just smiling at somebody really means a lot. Right. It can make a difference in that person's day. Mm-hmm. But just spreading loving energy like that, mm-hmm. that's what you're here for, and it really makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... Um, 
I'm, I am positive when I interact with the people, but I'm not like a smiley, like, lovey-dovey <laughs> Scary, scary smiley person? <laughs> no, I'm but, not. I mean, I do smile, but I'm not. Uh-huh. That's what second wave is supposed to do, just be right. and be generating positive energy that really affects people, and it's it's good. Yeah, you touch them more than you realize. What is, pardon me? You said you touch them more than you realize. Yeah. You're affecting um, and them what is, more than it, you realize. Uh-huh. Right. And specifically, what is the second wave? Specifically, what is the second wave? Well, they came in for that purpose to spread the energy, mm-hmm. the positive yeah. energy that's going to help change the world. Right. All of the waves are doing that. It's yeah. just they have different ways that they do it. In the second wave, it's their antennas, their, their channels of energy. They're just bringing it in. And the way I always see it is like it comes in and it just goes, it just swishes out of them across, mm-hmm. across all the planes. But is it a certain, a certain age group or... Oh, yeah, so you, she doesn't know about the waves, apparently. She's, is it a certain age group? Oh, how old are you? Um, four, no, oh, my God, I lose track of my age. Uh, there <laughs> you go. 44, 45. You're there. That's yeah, the second wave. That's second wave, <laughs> yes. They're 20s, 30s, they're, into they're, the early they're 30s 40s. They're 30s and 40s. They're 20s are the now the... Oh, okay. They're, yeah. they're like the very last end of the... Of the wave, uh, new children, yeah. Right. Oh, you're definitely one of them. But one of the problems mm-hmm. with the second wave is that they, some, a lot of them don't like people. They'd rather stay home and work at home and not have anything to do with people, <laughs> even though that's no, your job that's is not me. that energy. Are you no, like I that? No, I definitely no, um, no, no. I like to I like to get out. I mean, sometimes I end up staying in because. I kind of get overwhelmed with a lot that's going on in the world or whatnot, but I love getting out, even if it's just for people watching. But I do enjoy interacting with people. But when I was young, like young, I was incredibly shy. So over the years, I've, you know, gotten yeah. over that. Yeah, one of the things she said, she likes to watch people. They, the second yeah. way tends to be observers. They so, do. Mm-hmm. I've called them observers many times. Right. And uh, yeah, you definitely yeah. fit in with that, right? But this is you're you're on the positive side of it, so you're taking it and embracing it, which is wonderful because so many just want to stay holed up in their home and don't want to interact, and it's like here's all this wonderful energy not getting spread. So because that's they fantastic. don't like being around the other people and their right. energy. Right. I think you found a way to do it. That oh, <laughs> yeah, you. that's wonderful. So you're doing I, what I, you're I, supposed, supposed to be doing. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. And I also, yeah, because I've just been so in this for at least a few years, like not knowing, you know, my career, you know, nothing's really happening with that. And and you just wonder, like, gosh, am I, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but I feel like at least I have a purpose when I'm walking around, even though I'm not <laughs> doing anything to cr- contribute to paying my bills. And I don't, you know... <laughs> Yeah, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's why you're here is to do exactly what you're doing. Sounds and like it you're feels, doing and it. Feels good. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, I live in LA, so the weather is nice to be able to do oh, that. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> and you have access to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Especially where I live. I mean, it's just <laughs> well, so keep doing everywhere. what you're, you're you're doing a good job. Oh well, thank you. Okay, and thanks for calling in, Amy. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, I'm going to listen online. Okay. Okay, we've got a, a couple more on this one list of questions here. Uh, well, the one asked this one, are there any toilets on UFOs? And I read that, and I was thinking, that's a little strange. Well, but these are practical curiosity. questions, you know. <laughs> well, they, <laughs> they, I've heard them ask people to fly the jets, and they, when mm-hmm. they, they said, are there, what do you do? Are there mm-hmm. toilets on the spaceship right. and stuff mm-hmm. like that? Yeah. Well, you have bodily functions, but. ETs don't have the same bodily functions that we do. Right. That's, that's why I laughed mm-hmm. about it. 
because um, their bodies have changed so much that uh, a lot of the internal organs have atrophied, and they don't consume food the way we do. Many of them live off of light. They don't have to take anything into their body, and that's why their internal organs have atrophied. This is why the face looks different. They said a lot of people are afraid of the way they look because it has no emotion, because it's like frozen. Uh, They don't have to use the muscles of the face to talk because they do it telepathically, and they don't consume food. So it kind of turns into a mask. But actually, they're very loving, and they're communicating mentally. Right, and heart to heart. Yeah, heart to heart. So they may look scary, but that's just because all these muscles have atrophied. So, uh, but many of them we have found live off of light. And I asked them, where does the light come from? They said, from the source, or what that's what they call God. And many times, they have so many days or something on board the craft, they have to take what is called a light bath where they lie in something like a sarcophagus and are bathed in this light. And it depends how much they get, depends on how long it's been since they had their last one. And that's why I wanted to know where the light came from, because if they're out there in space, where where is it coming from? But it's everywhere. There's an inexhaustible supply. So their bodies have developed to the point that they don't need uh, food. And so... I doubt if there be any toilets on UFOs. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, though, but <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> You'd only have to have those bodily functions if you were consuming. Right. <laughs> okay. So if they have a kitchen on the craft, then they probably have toilets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I ask so many questions. They never know what we're going to come well, up with. Well, you know, they have all different kinds of... Being, so oh, there's, a, level, so. there's lots of different kinds of beings. And so I don't know if, um, you know, if, uh, how, with what the other ones would be like. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's another one here. Can an atomic explosion destroy the soul or configure it in a different matter? Hmm. Well, you know the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. personal experience on that one. <laughs> yeah, because I wrote the book. It's out of print now. The one, the soul remembers. But it's still on on uh, Kindle. It's still on ebook. It's on ebook. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. the soul remembers Hiroshima. One of the first books I ever wrote, where I had a young American girl go back to a lifetime as a Japanese man in Japan, and she was killed by the atomic bomb. And it's a really heart-wrenching story of what the Japanese people went through. That uh, we didn't need to drop that bomb, and it's how. But they went through with the bombing, and it's people when they listen to the recording of that session, they get up and run out of the room. They couldn't take the emotion the person was going through when the bomb dropped and what it did to their body. So it was a horrible way to die. And the man in the story lived for about. Uh, a week afterwards, but when he died, he was went went to the other side, just like spirit, and it didn't harm him. And he came back as this woman mm-hmm. in the next lifetime, American woman who knew nothing about anything of the Japanese culture or anything. So nothing can really harm the soul; it's eternal. Everything is energy. You can't kill energy; it just changes form. So even something like an atomic bomb, I don't see it changing, or you can't destroy the soul, though. That's impossible. No, what I'm saying is because you have two different planes of existence. Atomic bomb's on 3D, soul is on 4D or whatever. It's on a different plane. Wherever the mm-hmm. spirit side is, that's a different dimension, the right. spirit side. Mm-hmm. So um, I've been told many times you can't destroy a soul. I don't even think you could change it, she says, or change it in some way, I guess, by the radiation. No, it's like you said, we're all, we start, we're a spark of light. Yeah, when you um, take us back, when I've taken people back to what they really, really are, what their soul really is, it's just a tiny spark of light. So uh, that can't be harmed. The physical body is what is harmed. 
I've had people die in so many different ways. And I said, if I had somebody die in an atomic explosion and it didn't hurt them, and I know nothing will hurt them when we take them through the death experience. Right. But that's an interesting question. But, uh, no, it can't harm the soul. The soul goes on. I be- would believe it would go to the resting place. If it was, yes, if, that if it was traumatic. The resting place on the spirit side, where somebody uh, dies of a traumatic experience, they would go there to rest. They wouldn't come back into a physical body right away. So that would be a way to do that. Sometimes they stay there for quite a while to get over it before they get back on the wheel of karma. Right. Well, it looks like we're coming to that time again, and I'll save a lot of these other questions until the next time. Right. <laughs> that sounds good. It gives us stuff to do. And we're going to have a lot to talk about when we come back because we've got all of these conferences and things coming up. And I may be having more guests, too. Right, yeah, before the next conference. Yeah, because there wasn't a lot of time this week after right. we came back from Turkey to have people for the UFO conference come on. Well, we're hoping you all can join us at these conferences. We'd love to meet you. You know, this is... That's all we have them, so we can bring our speakers and us together with all of you, because we we love you. (laughs) We want to meet you. And we try to get information out to Mm -hmm. as many people as we can. That's the whole idea. Right. Share the information. And we believe in the positive, not the negative. Okay. So it looks like we've come to that time again. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. And you have a nice... um, We were past Easter. I can't say have a nice Easter. That was last weekend. Yeah, we're into spring now. Have a happy spring. Okay. (laughs) And we'll be back in May after we have these other things going on. So have a happy life, everyone. (laughs) And good night. Good night. Make it great. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.